morning, everyone. Hallelujah. Thank God for freedom. I want to turn to page number 28 today to open our service, if you will, and sing. I love this song. God has created everything and everybody. Would you stand, please, if you can? And he expects praise out of all his creation, and he gets it. The birds, the flowers, the rocks, everything he created is doing exactly what he wanted it to do. Now he expects us to give him praise too because of all his creation, it's us that owes him the glory, the praise, and the honor. So I want to sing this song. It's kind of wordy, uh, and you might have to hold the book kind of close like I do. But it says so much. It's taken from Psalm 148. <laughs> Sing it. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts to Together praise Him, the moon and stars on high. Praise Him, all ye heaven of heavens and ye flood above the sky. Let them praise as ye behold, for His name alone is high, and His glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. And good morning to all you listening from far off. Welcome. And I know you don't have that, probably don't have this song, but that's okay, just listen. All right, let them praises give Jehovah. They were made at his command, every one of them. Them forever he established. His decree shall ever stand. From the earth, praise Jehovah. All ye floods, ye dragons all. Read Psalm 148. Fire and hail and snow and vapor, stormy winds that hear him call. Sing it. Let them praises give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Then forever he established. And we shall ever stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah. All ye flood, ye dragons, oh. And his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes great and judges all, praise his name, young men and maidens, in the children's law. Let them praise his Jehovah, for his name above his and his glory is exalted, and his glory. I 
I've been, re uh, well, I've been watching a lot of TV lately. And on the Smithsonian Channel, they've been featuring the battles and things in actuality, the actual footage that they take, took in World War II. It'll break your heart. Amen. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of brave men gave their lives. And when you just look at it quickly, you say, you know, everything ended up a mess and all these people died all for nothing but it wasn't for nothing it was for our freedom the other side of it is bondage And bondage doesn't take a vacation or a day off. When you're in bondage, it's there when you go to bed. It's there when you get up in the morning. It will ruin you. It wears on you. I've been there. It'll break you and it'll destroy you. That's bondage. Freedom at any cost is worth it. We have so much to praise God for. Thank God for freedom. National freedom and spiritual freedom. If you got them both, you've got everything. While you're still standing, I want you to turn to page number 500. We'll be taking our offering in the back. You can leave it off when you, when you go out. And don't forget it. We'll sing. Part of this song, at least, America the Beautiful. When you walk out of here today, and the sun's shining on you, and you're free to go anywhere you want almost now, it's going to get better. Thank God. Keep it in mind. Here we go. 500.
sing the last verse. Oh, beautiful for papers green. Beyond the years, thine alabaster city clean. Un standing for prayer. First of all, I'm glad to be a Christian. Yes. And secondly, I'm glad to be an American. And thirdly, I'm glad to be free. Amen. And fourthly, I'm glad to be an Italian. Welcome, everybody. I want to welcome our live stream audience. So good to be in the house of God. The psalmist said in the 121st, uh, 22nd division, verse 1, he said, I was glad. How many are glad this morning? Yes. Been a long dry spell. But I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of God. And we just sang one of our first songs, Why We're Here in the House of God. And that is to exalt Amen. our God. Amen. To lift our voices in praise and adoration to God. To thank God for another week of victory. For another week of blessings and protection upon our lives. What a blessed privilege it is to be free. And what a blessing it is to be among God's wonderful people. I thank God for those that are raising up in this country. Those that are raising up and understand that our only hope, and we're living in that day, is the hope of the Lord. <laughs> Want to go to God in prayer, and <clears throat> Sister Lewis called, and most of you know she has leukemia and she's been taking this uh, chemo pill and she was very anxious through the, this past week waiting for her counts and they came back and the counts have improved and it appears that the Lord and the pill, if I can give a little honor to medical science, not taking anything away from God, but he's the one that gave us the mind to come up with that science. So ultimately, he gets the praise. Amen? Amen. Thank God. She's doing better. She sounds stronger in her voice. She just couldn't hardly say one sentence without stopping to say, I thank and praise God. I thank and praise God. Amen? Yes. I thank and I praise God. Also want to uh, remember Sister Kohler. Uh, she's recovering well from her surgery. We thank God. Sister Pettit has the, uh, and uh, Sister Wright, they have dialysis issues. We want to remember them in prayer. Also, we have a lot of unspoken requests that uh, we want to pray about this morning. And then we want to especially pray for our revival, which is going to begin next Sunday. And we'll have uh, Brother Holly is coming, a very capable minister, I think, and I pray, and I know we're going to be visited by God. So I want to get you ready. I want to challenge you. And I want to remind you that we are going to have special services next week, starting Sunday, and then following the morning service, we'll have a meal for everyone our dining halls are large enough that we can socially distance. And if the weather's nice, you can go outside and eat with the birds. It's up to you. 
but we are looking forward to hearing the word of God. I want to remember, Brother Holly, and we'll be going through from next Sunday. So we will be having Sunday night, right? Yes. Sunday oh, yeah, we're having a revival. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. And those services will be at 7 p.m. Okay, regular. Sunday night will be 6. Yeah, right. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. All I have to do is look at Brenda and she'll let us know. Thank God for a good secretary. All right. Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. Sunday night next week, 6 o'clock. And then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, 7 p.m. That'll be five services. We want to pray, especially pray for our revival. Also, we want to play, pray for our service. I'll take your burdens by an upraised hand. All right, let's look to the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Let's invoke God's presence. Father, we thank you. And yes, we are glad to be in the house of God this morning. And we're here to thank and praise you and to exalt your wonderful name. And to thank you for the good reports, the successful surgeries, those that are improving through treatments, through your watchfulness over their lives, through your healing powers. Lord, we thank you over and over again how wonderfully blessed we all are to have you as our God. And oh God, as we come into this service this morning, this Memorial Day weekend. We thank you for the lives that made the ultimate sacrifice on foreign soils to make us free this morning. And while America is struggling to remain free, we implore your presence we implore your grace and strength. We ask, O oh God, that you will awaken the churches in America, awaken us spiritually, awaken our patriotic hearts, awaken us to understand that we the people, by the grace of God, can continue to stay free and be the greatest country in the world. And we thank you for that this morning. We ask, oh God, that you would remember this list that was just read. We thank you for good reports. We pray, oh God, that you'll just continue to give these that are sick and afflicted, give them the strength Lord, we know that you're not only a savior, but you're our great physician. And we ask that you would touch these bodies. Lord, raise them up. Grant them an extension to their lives that they might continue to labor in this glorious kingdom of God. We pray, Father, that you will prepare our hearts We've been praying about the upcoming revival for weeks. But now, Lord, now, Lord, we need to knuckle down and we need to get in earnest for the revival that is coming, for the revival that is much needed, for the revival that we all need, for the opportunity for you, O oh God, to reset some things in the kingdom of God to remind us who we are, what we are, and what our purpose is. Oh God, we pray that you'll let that heavenly rain fall upon this congregation. May we be lifted up together, not only next week, but this morning as well. And how we thank you for all the blessings of the past. But God, we need fresh blessings for the present. 
and for the future. And so we commit all of these needs into your hands. And we thank you for those who are present and the hands that were raised and the burdens that were behind everyone. We pray, O oh God, that you will minister to their needs and that you will pass by this morning. And that when you pass by, we'll all reach out and touch you and thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Chad Wolf has a song, God bless him as he comes.
I happened to read in Proverbs. Of course, I travel with my job, and and I've been to different places. And as Brother Sherman was talking about the the men, but I always I always visit battlefields. I visit graveyards. I visit museums. I I, I I've been to the Queen Mary a couple times, where they had converted that ship to take men overseas. And you know, they were from every background. Some of them, I'm sure, were conscientious objectors and all that, but they were brothers. And they were fellow Americans. They went, they did their duty. But I was reading in Proverbs here, 24 and 10. It says, If thou faint in the day of adversary, thy strength is small. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, when you think of those pictures of stuff that came out of Europe, of the people that was led into those gas chambers and all that stuff, you know why our men went over there, delivered them. Because we have a heart. America has a heart to serve the Lord. And I want to see that continue. If thou sayest, behold, we knew not, doth not he that ponders the heart consider it? That's God. He's looking at us. And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? So we just can't sit by and be silent in many cases. If thou faint in the day of adversary, thy strength is small.
fights for freedom and songs we love to sing have freedom's theme. Some have gone through fire and flood to find the place of freedom. And some face hell itself for freedom's dream. Let freedom ring wherever minds know what it means to be in chains. Let freedom ring wherever. Oh, yeah.
testing one, two. How's that sound? Great. All right, Luke, the 19th chapter. <clears throat> Let's begin reading with verse 36. You're all familiar with the text, but it speaks volumes. <clears throat> it's Palm Sunday. And they had just found the donkey that Jesus requested to bring to him because the master had need of transportation. And so the disciples went out and they found this donkey and they brought it to the Lord. And the Bible said, never a man sat on this donkey. And when Jesus mounted, that donkey walked into multitudes of screaming people, throwing their palms down, throwing their clothes down. And nobody had ever rode that donkey. But that donkey had enough sense to know who was riding him. I hope that we have enough sense to know when Jesus is in our midst. And they brought him, nope, verse 36. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. You might want to underline that. They saw all the mighty works that Jesus had done in their midst. They saw unbelievable things. They saw amazing things. Keep that in mind. <clears throat> saying blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord peace in, peace in heaven and glory in the highest and some of the Pharisees some of the critics some of the fake news was among the multitudes and they said unto Jesus, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Here the Lord of glory is coming into the holy city. And the people who've seen all these marvelous works, who've seen all these miracles, they were thanking God, praising God. They were ecstatic. And these critics told Jesus, tell your disciples to shut up. Why would anybody want to shut up after seeing the wonderful things that Jesus does for people? Amen? You would have thought that the critics would have jumped in and said, you know, he really is a great guy, this Jesus. He really is a, a miracle worker. He speaks to the wind. He speaks to the waves. He speaks to this. He speaks to that. And, and what authority he wields. This guy is worth praising. But it didn't play out that way. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto Jesus, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And I love the classic answer that Jesus gave them. He said, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the very stones under my feet will cry out and praise me. Wow. You're going to let an old rock speak for you? You're going to let an old stone speak for you? No. You're going to let an inanimate object speak for you? 
No, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Verse 41, and when he was come near, he beheld the city. Here they're all shouting and praising God, and Jesus is weeping. The contrast is astounding. It's alarming. And it's thought-provoking. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. And this is what he said, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. I think one of the things that brings more anguish in my life is the things of God that are hid from the multitudes of Americans. The great and glorious things of God are hid. Not only from those in the secular world, but they're hid from many that are in the religious world. Just like these people. The holy city was the cream of the crop. The Jews were God's favored people for 4,000 years. And yet the things of God were hidden from them. That's alarming. If thou had known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come. It's too late now. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies, talking about the Roman armies, shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even to the ground and not only that, but your children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. They missed God. After 4,000 years, they missed God. America, we sang about the great start and the pilgrims that came and they came because they wanted to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. They came because they loved God. They came because they wanted to be free. Over the last 200 and whatever, 30 years, whatever it is. Jesus has been passing by in America. What a pathetic scene that is before us in our text. The careless, holy city filled with busy crowds full of their interests and pleasures and religious celebrations. Everything was about to unfold. And Jesus comes into the city looking down on it, weeping because he knew he had lived and would die. In vain. As far as the holy city and the people of God who were his people for 4,000 years, the majority of them, Jesus died in vain. He knew that what he was about to do about to become the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, he knew for his people, who had been his people for 4,000 years, he was going to die in vain for a great majority of them.
He knew that he was rejected by the religious leaders. He knew that he was rejected by the crowds. He knew that they would go, in, from, they would go in, in a short few days from praising God and crying Hosanna to God in the highest. They would be going from that kind of praise to crucify him, crucify him. He knew that he was rejected by the religious leaders because their ears and hearts were blended, blinded, excuse me, by their pride and their prejudice. The long story of 4,000 years of God's love and patience and grace was about to come to an end. Do you know what happened back then can happen today? We can send our day of grace away. America, with its wonderful start, its wonderful foundation, and how God shed his grace upon thee. But we are right on the brink of sinning our day of grace away in America. Because of the things that are going on in America. Don't have to catalog them, you know all about them. For three and a half years, Jesus showed them that the one weakness of a nation, which, which Serm just mentioned, was sin. And the worst bondage of all bondages was sin, spiritual bondage. Over and over and over again throughout the century, God's people refused to listen to the things that really belonged to their peace and happiness. What kind of things? His commandments and the priority of worshiping God and Him only and the love of God and the love of our neighbor being the ultimate priorities. But they sought to find their peace out in a world where iniquity, iniquity was abounding and political screams and greed and the pride of life and the lust of the flesh were running rampant in the streets. They refused the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, which declared 2,000 years ago, repent ye, for the kingdom of God is here. It is here. The kingdom is here. And there are people today preaching and saying the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is coming. But it already came 2,000 years ago. They refuse the simple gospel. They refuse the commandments of God. And they refuse to sing and understand. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. And peace would have come into their hearts like rivers of living waters, but they misunderstood and knew us not their time of God's visitation was about to end. It is important for us to understand this last phrase. Thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. They didn't miss the visitation of God because they weren't there when it happened. They were there. They saw the miracles, the healings, they saw the changed lives. They saw professional men, uh, blue collar men, turn around and leave their livelihoods and go and follow the Lord. They left their boats, they left their nets, they left their businesses, and they started to follow this man called Jesus. They saw it. Not only did they see it, they heard it. The sermons of Jesus and the disciples. They heard the stories of Lazarus being raised from the dead. They heard how the winds and the waves obeyed his voice. 
They knew of the prophecies and signs of the Messiah coming. So someone asked, well, what happened? How did they miss it? They didn't pay attention. They sat in their temples. They sat in the streets. They sat on the mountainsides. And they listened to the sermons. And they saw the miracles. And they saw God's wonderful works being manifested. But they didn't really pay attention. And that's why I'm preaching this message this morning. Because we're going into a revival next week. And we are going to be visited by God through his word. And I want this church more than ever to pay attention. To understand how important it is to be alert, high alert, be on high alert when it comes to the things of God. And not to disrespect the word of God, but listen. Give our minds a little. Give our hearts a little. Because we are hearing words of life. And my concern is this. I don't want the Church of God of Licking County or any other church for that matter to miss connecting. And if need be, reconnecting with God. Revivals and camp meetings and Sunday services are not everyday moments. They are not casual events of our daily routines. They are windows of opportunities. They are solemn assemblies. What's the most solemn thing we do every week? It's when we come into the house of God. It's when we find our prayer closet and get in it and close the door. It's when we take the word of God and get into a quiet place and read about these wonderful things, these living words, these living letters. Those are solemn assemblies. Those are solemn moments. And the context of Jesus' words in these verses what, what, what is happening here is too late for those people, but it's a wake-up call for those of us who are reading about it 2,000 years later. It's there for our admonition. It's there for our safety. It's there for our protection. But you've got to pay attention. And that something is when it comes to Jesus passing by, when it comes to being in a solemn assembly, we don't decide the times of our healings, we don't decide the moments of our breakthroughs. We don't decide the salvations and the callings of God upon our lives. If God doesn't draw us, and God waits for these solemn moments, these solemn assemblies, these moments uh, when the atmosphere uh, can can develop into a spiritual moment, But our breakthroughs don't come because we say breakthroughs be gone. They come when God is ready. And God doesn't come until we are ready. And that's what I want to talk to you about just for a few moments. I want you, I want me, I want this church to get ready. As Christians, we are not on our schedules and our agendas so much as we are on God's clock, God's time, God's will. 
And it's up to us to prioritize our schedules around God's agendas for fear that we might miss something life-changing. The holy city was shouting and praising God because they didn't pay close attention to all those glorious visitations of the Lord. Their last window of opportunity was about to close. After 4,000 years, the spiritual economy and the blessed favor of being called the children of God for 4,000 years was about to end. That's why John writes in John 1.11, Jesus came to his own, and his own refused him. Why? Because they knew us not. They couldn't discern. They couldn't tell when Jesus was in their midst. They couldn't tell when God was speaking through his son. They couldn't discern the time of their visitation. They just didn't get excited about the things of God. God would have blessed them abundantly. He would have given them victory after victory. He would have given them peace of mind a peace that this world knows nothing about. But they didn't take it seriously. They didn't pay attention. They found time for what they wanted to do. For what they loved to do. But when it came to the things of God, the excitement... just wasn't there. What happened to them has happened since then many times over. God's people in this country, they have lost the thrill of it all. I'm glad that the gospel still thrills me. Amen? There's nothing I enjoy more than sitting in, in, in a pew, listening to somebody open up the scriptures. An anointing falls on him, and the same anointing falls on us. They found time for whatever they wanted to do, but when it came to the Lord, they lost the cutting edge. If only they had just applied to the things of God the same energy they put into loving the world or loving sin or loving themselves, they would have discovered the more abundant life. They would have started living the real dream. They let it go right over their heads. There's a heavy price to pay for not staying excited about the things of God. Think about that. I'm afraid the churches today and the Bible warns us and the Bible prophesies that in the seventh seal age, which we are in, according to gospel revelation and prophecy, there's no absolute, no doubt that revelation is a history lesson. And we are in the Laodicean age. What kind of age are we in? A half-hearted, drowsy, hesitant, wishy-washy age when it comes to the things of God. The energy and the excitement for the things of God 
It's just not there in our churches like it was years ago. And Jesus is the same yesterday as he is today. How he blessed back there, he wants to bless here. And this age has developed an attitude that our Lord does not speak highly about. Jesus said in Revelation 3, you know this, so then, because thou art lukewarm, tepid, and neither cold nor hot, I would that thou were either cold or hot, but since thou art neither, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Question, is my life giving the Lord a bad taste? That is not a compliment coming from our Lord. Lukewarmness is an insult to God. It's you and I becoming indifferent. Just brushing it off. Just ignoring the things of God. We can be in services where Jesus is walking up and down the pews. And we got our mind on a hundred other things. That's offensive to the Lord. The churches today are paying a high price for their lethargy and lukewarmness. And in our text, Matthew's rendition as well, Jesus was coming down into the city And he knew that the city was doomed. He knew that 4,000 years of being God's special people, the Jews, it was about to come to an end. Jesus said, how often? I would have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but you would not. You know what Jesus is saying? I would have comforted you. I would have put you under my wings and protected you. I would have fought for you. I would have saved you. But you weren't interested. You weren't excited enough. He that hath ears, let him hear. What the Spirit is saying to the churches. Not all moments are created equal. But when Jesus is in the house, hey, when Jesus is at the well with the Samaritan woman, when they broke the roof to put a, a crippled man down in the house, he went in the house where Jesus was. When Jesus is in the house, you can get healed. When Jesus is at the well, with a Samaritan who was hated by the Jews. Our Lord was a Jew. She walked away with living water and left her natural water. When, you're, when Jesus is in your boat, it's not going to sink. When Jesus is passing by, A blind Bartimaeus is no longer blind. You got to know when the time is ripe. You've got to know when to strike. The woman with the issue of blood, she heard that Jesus was in town. That's all she needed to know. She spent everything she had on positions. She spent it all. She, she had this problem for years. But she said, if I could just get through this crowd and just touch the hem of his garden, I'm going to be healed. When Jesus is in the neighborhood, people don't pee and poop in the street. 
they cut their lawns. Not every car is up on blocks. Hallelujah. My neighbors came to me the other day and we got a, a railroad ties between my property and theirs and you know they put tons of gravel and knocked everything down. They're going to fix it. They're good neighbors. And a guy came up to me and he said, we're going to put a retaining wall maybe from here to where you're sitting, Mark, along our property. And we're going to pour cement. He says, what color do you want the cement to be? Boy, is he conscientious or what? Oh, I want my cement to be pink. <laughs> I didn't know there was another color for cement. Oh, when Jesus is in town, things are going to happen. When Jesus is at your wedding, when Jesus is in your hospital room, when Jesus is, is with you in the furnace, it behooves us to pay attention but see, because he wants to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And he does. Amen. Hallelujah, Mike. Look at the brothers in the Bible. This just came to me, but I want to make a point. Look at the brothers in the Bible. Abel was excited about God. Cain was jealous. The elder brother was mildly excited about father's house, but the prodigal was not. Jacob was excited about spiritual things, but Esau, he was too busy hunting. Jacob was thrilled with God, but his brothers hated him. Joseph, he was thrilled by God, but his brothers were jealous. David was excited to fight Goliath, who was blaspheming his God. He brought lunch to his brothers, and the battle was at a standstill, and Goliath was there blaspheming the name of God. And David went up to Saul and said, who is this guy? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine mocking my God? Well, nobody will fight him. David said, I will. When Jesus is on the field, everything's going to be all right. The Bible gives us many pictures of individuals and families where some were excited about God and some were not. And as those situations play out in the Bible, we see over and over again that God was his best and all others, that God's way is best and that all others' way, all others' ways are going to lead to sorrow, heartache. And misery. You don't have to turn me turn there. Let me give you an example, and I'm going to jump out here because I can't finish this. But let me give you an example in 2 Samuel 6. I love this story. I read it over and over again. We find King David returning the Ark of the Covenant. The, the God box got lost. The Philistines took it. And when they took it, they had mega problems. And they had to get rid of that box because it made them itch too much. And so the box finally ended up at Obed, D Obed Edom's house. It wasn't in the holy city. And David heard somebody come to David and said, hey, let me tell you something. The Ark of the Covenant is at Obed-Edom's house and it's only been there three months and Obed-Edom and all his household, they're being blessed abundantly because the presence of God is in that home. Look at the blessings, the privileges, the happiness, the joy, the victory that we're missing because our homes are divided. Our marriages are divided. And 
it don't have to be that way. And so David, he goes up to Obed-Edom's house. And he says, I'm bringing the box back to Israel. You ought to read it. It's a great story. They were praising God, blowing trumpets. And they took the ark, the, the box, the ark, the God box. And they put it on the cart, wherever it was. And they did it right this time. Because previously to that, it was on its way. And the, the oxen went over a bump. And the, the, they thought the, the ark of the covenant was going to fall. And Uzzah touched it. And God stroke him dead, struck him dead. You can't touch God until he's ready. You can't touch God unless your heart is clean. Your life is clean. And they were bringing that ark back from Obed-Edom's house. And the Bible says, the priests, when they're carrying it, one, two, three, four, five, six. Stop! David offered sacrifices unto God. The trumpets were blowing. They praised God. After that, one, two, three, four, five. Six. I don't know how many miles it was from Obedi's house to Israel. But every six steps, they made sacrifices. You, you know what that means? You and I can't make enough sacrifices for God. He's worth every one of our sacrifices. And so, as they started to come into the city, all the people started shouting. They started praising God. And the Bible says uh, that David... He was dancing, he was twirling, he was flossing, he was doing the twist, he was doing it all. Amen. I can, I can floss. But David, he was rocking. They were praising God. All Israel was shouting and blowing trumpets. But when David's wife, Michal, looked through the window and saw the king dancing before the Lord with all his might, before the maidens, the handmaidens, the Bible said she despised them in her heart. You see, if you're married, you both got to be going the same direction. Amen? You got to be going the same direction. But when he got home, she unloaded on him. I love what the Bible says. She says, how glorious was the king today who uncovered himself to the eyes of the handmaiden. Shame on you. You got to know when, you're, when your spouse is, is, is anointed. Yeah? If you don't know when your, house, your spouse is anointed, you might say the wrong things. And if they hurt your spouse and they're anointed, you just struck at God. And David answers her and says, I wasn't dancing for you. Amen. And I wasn't dancing for the maids. I was dancing for the Lord who chose me to be ruler over Israel, the people of God. I was dancing because God, when I took him with us into the battle, we won battle after battle. I was praising God because he saved me. And while I was praising God, Michael, while I was praising God, dear wife, I was getting more excited. 
because I remember how God saved me. And how God gave me that bear skin that's in our den. And how God gave me that lion skin and it's in front of our fireplace. And I remember that God gave me uh, uh, old big daddy's head and his sword and it's in my trophy case. That's why I got the praise of God and flossing. I was excited. And I was dancing for God because his presence is back in the camp. And he said to her, and one other thing, sweetheart, the next time I go to church, I'm going to dance even harder. I'm going to praise God even more. You can sit there like a wooden Indian if you want, but God's presence is back in the camp. And wherever God's presence is, we are going to be winners, never losers. Hallelujah. Now look at the cost of missing the time of God's visitation. God saw it all. And if you read the scripture, God cursed David's wife for mocking David. See, David took off his priestly robe, took off his, uh, his uh, whatever, that, you know, his, his cape or whatever. His kingly garment, yeah. He didn't strip or anything. But his wife was giving him a hard time. And God saw it. And you know what the Bible said? Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, the wife of David, had no children until the day of her death. From that day forward, God closed her womb. You don't want to mock you don't want to throw stones and you don't want to mess with God's people. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And half our government is throwing darts and rocks and stones and everything they can. Doing everything they can to keep us from going back to work and going to church. Oh, the blessings that God wants to birth among his people. But they'll never be birthed among a people who are not eager, not thrilled, and not excited about the things of God. People who come into our services, members perhaps, and sit there, and the presence of God is, is walking up and down in our services, and people are sitting there like McCall. Well, you can't birth anything for God. You hear me? You can't birth anything for God if you're not excited about God. I'm going to jump out. Excitement about the things of God will take us to heights we've never been. There's things we'll never give birth to until we put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Until we learn to put our whole heart into God's service with joy and excitement, we must never let our souls become dormant and sluggish in the things of God. If we do anything well, We've got to worship God well. We've got to praise God well. As I close, I wonder 
as Jesus looks upon our churches in America, as he looks upon our church here in Newark, what does he see? Does he see our excitement? Does he see our joy and happiness being manifested? Or does he see our lack of excitement and our lack of passion for the things of God? The things of God, the blessing of God, the salvation of God, the anointing of God, I can't find it for you. You can't find it for me. We've got to find it for ourselves. When was the last time you really got excited and passionate about the Lord? about really letting him take control of your life. When's the last time you really got blessed in worship? When's the last time God spoke to you upon your bed? Oh, I wanna ask you, is he real? Yes, he's real. Is he real to you this morning? Amen. Or are we just going through the motions? Jesus said, how oft I would have gathered you. Let me close. Oh, you don't know the things that I have in store for you. You have no idea of the peace that you just forfeited. The joy that you forfeited. The happiness that you forfeited. The victories that you forfeited. Because you weren't paying attention. What a mighty God we serve, Sheriff. Yeah. He's a barber. He forgot it, but he's a barber. I'm reminding him. But God blessed Obed Edom here. Every one of us who knows God, we're blessed. But that's why we have solemn assemblies. That's why we call revivals. That's why we hunger and thirst for God's agenda. If there's anybody here and it's not that you're a bad person, but how easy it is today to lose the edge. How easy it is with all the negativity that's going on and all the things that we're seeing in our world. It's so easy to say, forget it. And walk away from it all. Some of you, not three or four services to go by, didn't even have to wait for a Wednesday night. You just couldn't stay in your seat any longer. You stand up and you had to praise God. I remember some of you used to wave the hanky and it wasn't a sign of surrender. It was a sign of thanksgiving and praise. Amen. You don't want to miss it. And you know what I know? Jesus is in the house this morning. Yes, sir, he's in the house. He's in the same house you're in this morning. And if you lost the edge, why don't you just take a moment and reach out? 
touch him. And let him light the stove again. Let him light the fire. Let him light your fire. Amen. And then by the time next week comes, we'll be ready. For whatever God sends our way through the preacher, we'll be ready. Ready to praise God, ready to thank God, ready to drag somebody into the house of God who's lost. We'll be ready. If anybody needs to pray before we leave, take a moment to discern and recognize Jesus is in the house. Don't miss him. His office is open. He's the wonderful counselor and he's waiting to talk to whoever needs help. Whoever's carrying a load, whoever is burdened down by life and its circumstances, Jesus is in the house. Maybe you need to talk to him before you leave. Let us sing. God bless you. Come on. Come, let's pray for the revival. Let's pray for our needs. Let's thank God. Number 373. God bless you. 373. I need thee every hour. Still got it. Most gracious Lord. No and I want some of us to take a moment and let's pray for this revival. Let's pray that some people get saved, some people get saved, and some people get healed. Are you paying attention to what I'm saying? To what God is saying and asking of us? Let's just take a moment. Bring that burden down here. Bring that broken heart. Bring that pain. Bring that addiction. Bring that habit. Whatever it is, Jesus is in the house. He can do it for you this morning. Temptations lose their power when I need thee, oh, I need thee. Boy, every hand in the building ought to go up on that every phrase. My God, we need it. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come. One more verse, Sharon. You know. God loves to hear you say, God, I need you. All week long. Almost every two, three hours. God, I need you. I got to have something to, to say Sunday. The church needs you. People who are sick need you. Maybe God needs to hear you say that. As Sherm sings one more verse, we're going to let you go. I need thee every hour in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide or life is vain. 